I think any sincere Christian begins to question certain things around this time of the year, the Christmas season, as to, you know, is it really all about Jesus Christ, uh, everything that people do? Now, I know what is in a person's heart is between them and God. In other words, a person can sincerely say, okay, I am grateful, at least, for the birth of the Savior uh, coming into the world. That I am grateful for. And, of course, no one can, can take that away from you, what is in your heart. But from God's perspective, as he looks at the heart of people, the heart of America, he would look at, okay, what's in the heart of people at Christmas time. And the way you decide that is by what people do. Now, I don't know if you realize that, but you know, the heart is more than just your emotions. Your emotions are revealed. What's really in your heart is revealed by what you do. And so I know what a lot of people do at Christmas time is basically it is a day of indulgence where people spend and You know, basically, that's the only way I know how to sum it up, a day of indulgence. Now, I think any sincere student of the Bible knows that Jesus was not born on December 25th. There's a lot of obvious reasons for that. Uh, The shepherds were still tending their flocks, and they would not be doing that in the middle of winter. But I think most students of the Bible, if they study into this, and that's a big if, but if they study into this, they know that it comes from a winter festival called the Saturnalia, and uh, it was a celebration of the shortest day of the year, the win- winter solstice, and it was a time, it had nothing to do with religion whatsoever. It was just a time of merrymaking, gift swapping, and excessive drinking, sort of like a drunken orgy was what it was about. And the Catholic Church looked at this festival and said, you know, the pagans really like this festival, the Saturnalia. If we could Christianize it, if we could call it Christ's Mass or Christmas and say Christ was born on this day, we could get a lot more converts in, into the church. Now, you have to question as far as motive. Was that motive right? You know, that's something you have to decide on. Now, the real question is, well, shouldn't we acknowledge the birth of the Savior? I mean, after all, we're talking about the birth of the Savior. Should we not acknowledge at least the birth of the Savior? And my answer is, yeah, we should. But it would be nice if we did it on the right day. Truth of the matter is, if you're celebrating Jesus' birth on December 25th, you've just missed his birthday by three months. Is That Really in the Bible? presents the teaching ministry of David Freeman. E.W. Bullinger, who is a, um, he actually put together the companion Bible. You may have that. But he places the birth of Jesus Christ on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall during the Holy Day season. Now, there's other ways to figure this, and I don't have time to go through this, but you can study the course of Abijah. The priests served in the temple. They had rotations that they would serve. You can study uh, the conception of Elizabeth. You can study the conception of Mary with the birth of Jesus. And if you follow that through, and it is a complicated study, but if you follow that through, you it will lead you to the birth of Jesus being in the fall of the year under the moon of which would basically be our month of September October it would fit into that uh, area of time as to when Christ was actually born now why do I believe that Jesus was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles well first of all you got to back up and say okay what is a fe- what is the Feast of Tabernacles now most people who go to church have never heard of the annual holy days found in your Bible. In Leviticus 23 and verse 4, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord. These are the feasts of Jehovah, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim 
in their seasons. The holy days revolved around the seasons of the year, and the seasons revealed something. It meant something. In fact, the holy days are all about Jesus Christ. So why do I believe that Jesus was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles? Because it fits the symbolism of that holy day. In other words, the holy days, when I say they're all about Christ Jesus, I mean, consider the Passover. Most people have heard of the Passover, but it's about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's about the the Passover lamb. Christ became our Passover lamb. Then you go, you go, um, that introduces, the Passover introduces the holy day seasons, but then you go into the first day of un- unleavened bread. And I know people, first day of unleavened bread, what in the world is, is that? That is strange. I've never heard of that. Or if they have heard of that, they will say, well, that's Jewish and that it's not meant for us. Well, no, it's, it's, well, it may be Jewish, but it's biblical is my point. It's biblical. These are the feasts of Jehovah, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. This this is not a suggestion, by the way. Okay. This, This is something that we are to do. But what I'm saying is these holy days are all about Jesus Christ. Okay. Days of unleavened bread, for example. We are to put Christ in the symbolism of the uh, the unleavened bread is Jesus Christ, and we are to put the leavening, which represents sin, out of our life. And it fits, okay? Now, if you're going to be forgiven of your sins with the Passover lamb that takes away the sins of the world, if you're going to be forgiven, well, then the next step is to put Christ in and to put sin out. And that's what the days of unleavened bread are all about. Well, then you go to Pentecost, the next holy day. And Pentecost is about receiving the Spirit of Christ. Now, if you're going to do this, if, you, if you're going to be forgiven, okay, with the Passover, with the Days of Unleavened Bread, you're going to put Christ in and put sin out. You need power to do that, to accomplish that. Well, how are you going to accomplish that? Well, by the, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ or by the Spirit of God, which is what Pentecost is all about, receiving the Spirit of God. Well, then you go to the fall festivals, uh, which the Feast of Trumpets, the return of Christ Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the trump shall shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised. Then you go to the Day of Atonement, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Now, another meaning of the Day of Atonement that people often overlook is that it's a day when uh, God's enemy, Satan, the devil, will be rendered powerless. His power will be taken away. And the fact that this being, Satan, who is going to be dealt with eventually, his time is going to be up. He's going to be cast out to deceive the nations no more, which is another meaning of the Day of Atonement. But then after that, you come to the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents we are tabernacling in this physical body that wears out. We, we're, we're a temporary tent, okay? And we only have a short time here. And then you go to the last holy days, the last great day, which is really all about Christ's mercy for humanity and the fact that everybody is going to get a chance for salvation according to God's timing. So these these holy days are revelatory. They reveal what God is doing. The holy days reveal what Christ has done, what Christ is doing now through mankind, and what Christ is going to do in the future. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but without these three things, you cannot have hope in the world. And you would think that the church is the place you would go to find out about these things. And it seems like most religions just focus on what Christ has done. But they don't really focus on, okay, not only what Christ has done, but what Christ is doing through mankind and what Christ is going to do in the future. And like I said, without the knowledge of these three things, which are revealed in the meaning of the Holy Day season, 
without the knowledge of these three things, what Christ has done, what Christ is doing through mankind right now, and what Christ is going to do, you can't have any hope. You'll, you'll go around through life in a hopeless situation, not knowing the meaning of life. You'll look at world events and all the things that are going on, and you think, has God abandoned us? No, the holy days are revelatory, and they are so important. So we come to this one holy day, the Feast of Tabernacles, which I believe Jesus was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, why would I say that? Well, let's look at John 1 and verse 14. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, the word was made flesh and dwelt. The word dwelt there means tabernacled. Christ tabernacled among us. Now, there's a lot of symbolism here to this day and to the actual birth of Jesus Christ. Now, consider this. Okay, let's say, born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, circumcised eight days later, which would lead you to the last great day. Now, these things are not just coincidental, you know, they're not just coincidence. I think they have meaning with the symbolism of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, when we consider, okay, Christ tabernacled among us in the flesh, he became what we are, flesh and blood. You see, your tabernacling began the day that you were born, okay? The day that you, uh, now you know that date, okay? Now just, just think about this, the day that you were born. And, you know, the Bible refers to, you know, a tabernacle, the, the human body as a tent. So you have this brand new tent that you take out of the box and you set it up outside in the yard. And it's a brand new tent. Well, what happens if you just leave it there and you come back 50 years later? Well, it begins to wear out. In fact, there's probably nothing left 50 years later. So the Bible refers to the body as a temporary tent. And I'll never forget, it was, it was uh, up in the mountains, there was this little secret hideaway that this man had, and I would ride my dirt bike up in the mountains or my four-wheeler. He had a tent up there, and uh, really by, beside a creek bank, and uh, it was just a cool little place to go to, and and uh, I would go up there and sit in a little chair that he had and just sort of meditate and look at the beauty around me. Well, I forgot about that place, and I went back many years later, and the tent was just nothing left but the tent poles, you know. <laughs> it was just all shreds. And, and so this is how the Bible refers to our temporary tabernacle, our temporary tent. It's physical, and it, it gets old. It gets ugly. It wears out. Now, there's many scripture references to this and i'll just read you a few second corinthians 5 and verse 1 it says for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved yeah this tent just was dissolved we have a building a house of god not made with hands eternal in the heavens for we uh verse uh second corinthians 5 and verse 4 for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Yeah, it's true. You know, this temporary tent that we have, as we age, we begin to groan. And we begin to say, oh, the aches and the pains and the doctors and the uh, the diagnosis and everything that's going on in my body. And we begin to groan. And we want mortality. We want immortality is what we want. We want, we want to be given a new body, a new tent or whatever, which will be quite different than, than the one we have right now. Second Peter 1 verse 13 says, Yea, I think it me as long as I am in this tabernacle. Notice this, this, the reference to the body as a temporary tabernacle. To stir you up, putting you in remembrance. And then Second Peter 1 and verse 14, Knowing that shortly I must put off my tab this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Yeah, we have to put off this temporary tent, this physical body. At the resurrection, it will be changed from flesh to spirit, and uh, you'll shed this physical body if you're still alive at the return of Christ. But if you're dead, you know, you'll be resurrected and given a new body. And so I come back to this verse in John 1 and verse 14. And the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, 
glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, there's something that the enemy said long ago in Isaiah 14 and verse 14. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, most Christians just simply over, they gloss over this, that Satan says, I will be like the Most High. Not, not opposition, not different. I'm going to be like him. Whatever he does, I'm going to do it better, but I'm going to pervert it, twist it, manipulate it, counterfeit it into something different. You see, I believe Lucifer has a counterfeit for every one of the holy days of God. Now, again, the holy days are found in your Bible. These are the feasts of Jehovah. The holidays that man keeps are basically the traditions of men. It is man's method for worshiping God. So, again, I believe he counterfeits every one of these holy days that is found in the Bible. And I think it's true when it comes to this issue of Christmas and the Feast of Tabernacles. So I want to look at some similarities between Christmas and the Feast of Tabernacles. Because, again, people will say, well, shouldn't we acknowledge the birth of the Savior of the world? And I believe that, that, that we should. In fact, when I go to the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, they have an opening night at the feast where they talk about the birth of the of the savior of the world that it's it's a service dedicated to acknowledging the birth of Jesus Christ it's a time when we rejoice over the fact that Christ was born in fact the bible says in Luke 2 and verse 10 it says and the angel said unto them fear not for behold i bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so I come back to the Feast of Tabernacles. What, is, what does the Bible tell us to do at the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 15, it says, Seven days you shall keep a solemn feast unto the Lord. Talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says, and you shall go to that place where the Lord God shall choose, because the Lord your God shall bless thee in all your increase and in all your works of your hand. Therefore, you shall surely rejoice. Now, notice this. We are commanded at the feast to rejoice. But what are we going to rejoice over? Well, how about the fact that Christ was born under that moon, which connects to our September, month of September, in the fall, in the feast, holy days. Now, that's something to rejoice over. In fact, the Bible and in the instructions here, it says, you shall surely rejoice. And again, one of the things that we're, we're rejoicing over is the fact that Christ was born. And it would be nice if we could get the date right, by the way. Okay, a lot of people will say, well, Christmas is the time when families are together. And that's a good thing, and it is a good thing. But let's notice the instructions about keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. After, the, after that, you have gathered in your corn and your wine, and you shall rejoice in thy feast, thou, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are within your gates. It's a family thing. It's a family thing. It's, a, it's The Feast of Tabernacles brings families together. Why? Well, because you're celebrating it together. You are told to celebrate it together as a family unit. There's hardly anything that can bring families together more than God's holy days. We are closer as a family because of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because it's not just one day and then it's all over with. It's seven days that you go to the feast. Another thing people will say, well, Christmas is a time of giving. Well, that could be debated. It's probably more like gift swapping. But let's notice this, instructions about keeping the feast. It says in Deuteronomy 14, verse 26, and you shall bestow that money. It's talking about you save up money in order to keep the feast. You don't use money as an excuse. Well, I don't have any money. No. No, you save up all year long for this event. 
for the keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says this, and you shall bestow that money, once you've saved that money, on whatever your soul lusts after, for oxen, for sheep, or wine. Now, keep in mind, this, this was an agrarian society, so we don't really need an oxen today, unless you're a farmer. But it's, it's saying, okay, spend that money on whatever your soul lusts after, for wine, for strong drink, or whatever your soul desires. And you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice. And there again is the command to rejoice, you and your household. So I think this is cool that the, often at the feast, people get gifts for their children or each other, or in, in this case, you go out and get the gift, which is, makes a lot more sense. I mean, you know what you want. And instead of, uh, you know, drawing names and getting underwear or something like that, you know, you, you can go out and, and get the thing that you want by yourself a gift, which really makes a lot more sense, by the way. Another thing people often say is, well, Christmas is a time of beauty. Well, if you like the cold, it, it may be, and the snow and all that. But, you know, what, what's interesting about the feast is there are so many feast locations throughout the entire world. Yeah, I'm talking about even in different countries, you can find people celebrating the feast. And there are beaches you can go to. If you like mountains, if you like cold weather, well, you can pick a feast in, in you know, in a different location in the mountains or something like that. But the feast locations, there's a huge variety. There's a feast in Hawaii. There's a feast in, in Australia. There's feast sites all over the world. Another thing I think is interesting is that there is no emotional letdown after keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, you go away spiritually high when you leave the feast. Because the feast is not just about one day of self-indulgence. It's not. It's a lot more to it than that. Oh Yeah, there's the celebration of the birth of, of Christ, yeah. But it's more to it than that. I mean, there's there's rich sermons and spiritual messages that you receive. There's song and and dance and and just there's events that you can do. There's seminars that you can go to. It's it's an educational process of getting your life together and being encouraged for seven days and and it's it's just a you you go away from that experience high on God because you've done what God told you to do. So I come back to the fact that Christianity does have an enemy, and this enemy said, I will be like the Most High, and I truly believe that this enemy, our enemy, counterfeits every one of God's holy days. In other words, I will take what the written word says, you know, these are the feasts of Jehovah, and I will take these holy days, and, and because I realize man needs to worship God, but I will counterfeit it, I will do it differently, I will twist it, I will pervert it, and I will come up with a method for that people can worship God that is solely materialistic, that is nothing more than a day of indulgence. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, people say it's all about Jesus, in which, you know, when people... You know, I have to be careful when I tell people I don't celebrate Christmas. I, I have to also go one step further and say it, it's not that I don't believe in Jesus. Because a lot of people, when I tell people I don't celebrate Christmas, immediately they look at you like you're crazy and they say, you don't believe in, in Jesus Christ. And so I have to tell them it, it's, it, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's just that I don't believe that everything people do at Christmas is all about Christ. And I judge that by their actions, what they're actually doing. Well, you, you know, and people will say, well, you shouldn't judge the heart of a person. Well, I judge by their actions. And what I see is a grand day of indulgence. I mean, just look at your commercials on TV. But I think it's interesting that this being who says, I will be like the Most High, not opposite, not different, but like the I will have my own religion, you see. And that he takes this and just turns it into something basically that has no meaning whatsoever. And that often leads people at the end of it all, after the one day of indulgence, people go away emotionally drained. And it's like, I can't believe it's over with. That was it. You know, and it leads people, it, it leaves people empty inside. And one of the things I can guarantee you is this. 
God's instructions, God's holy days, never, ever, which are all about Jesus Christ, will never leave you feeling empty inside. They uplift. They instruct. They correct. They lift your spirits where you will be high on God because you're doing what he tells you to do. Now, in Revelation 21 and verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God has always desired to tabernacle with man. He sent his son in the flesh to tabernacle with us. And of course, his tabernacling lasted 33 and a half years. And there's, the thing, though, there's always been this barrier between us and God. And that barrier is being corrected day in and day out. The outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. So what can we conclude from this? Well, number one, Christ was born under this moon or under that moon of September during the fall holy day season. He was born, I believe, on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles that he came to the, in, the, in the flesh to tabernacle with us, among us. Second thing we found is Leviticus 23 and verse 4. It says, these are the feasts of Jehovah, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. It's important that you acknowledge this to the world, that you tell the world about these days and the meaning of these days. And the third thing we're told to do at the feast is we're commanded to rejoice. And one of the reasons we rejoice is because Christ Jesus was born under that moon and during the time of the fall holy days, during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. If you would like more information or if you have any questions, write to Is That Really in the Bible? 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151 or visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.net. For more information, check us out online at isthatreallyinthebible.net. Listen to the podcast, watch the weekly program, worship with us on our weekly Sabbath service, and be sure to visit our free bookstore. Again, the website is isthatreallyinthebible.net.